This is the ISG Digital Dish. Welcome to Digital Dish, a podcast for women's voices and perspectives in the digital world. We interview women in all industries because digital affects them all. As hosts, we want to share our passion and humor about the digital world we're part of, and we each bring a unique perspective and view from women in all parts of business. You're going to hear topics ranging from technical to organizational challenges, anything that speaks to how women are tackling issues to improve their environment. I'm Jeannie Cuff. I have a deep curiosity on how women approach their careers in digital, and I'd love to hear their perspective on what they do and how they think about the careers. And of course, talking to smart women is fun. I'm Lois Coatney, and I love hearing these interviews and bringing both a historical view and a future perspective to those interviews. It's so great to have such a variety of women who do so many things in their digital careers. And I'm Julie Fernandez. I have a human resources perspective, and I really like to think about how these discussions affect people and organizations. Together, we wanted to make sure smart women and their point of views were being heard. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, hey, Jeannie. How are you? So good. Today, it's just me and Lois. Uh, we've lost Julie somewhere along the line. Yeah, but we'll find her again. I think she's sleeping because she ran a conference last <laughs> week. So I, I'm kind of thinking that. Eh, so today, we have Madeline Nelson, who I met when I was doing volunteer work at Chick Tech. And everybody knows Chick Tech, so I'm not going to say it again. But I wanted to bring up some important statistics about a volunteering. So a couple of interesting, I found this, it was CNN had a, a report on this from 2018. So they said, first of all, women volunteering, they used to volunteer up until the turn of the 20th century. They used to do all the volunteering just about. But even though women went back to started working more and being more involved in the workforce, uh, men's, they didn't go down. Actually, men's volunteering went up. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I think there's some competition going on. There. I know. Isn't that weird? Multitasking. Well, exactly. You know, hey, if you want to get something done, uh, ask a busy woman. So women volunteer more than men do, like 28% to 22%. But that number for men has gone up. So that's a good number. And then the last thing is the volunteer age, 35 to 44, 29%. This is overall volunteers. That's the age range. And 45 to 50 is 28%. So a good like 60, 70% of the volunteers are in the 35 to 54. So that's, you know, interesting news. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's interesting because you would think, well, I guess maybe I'm looking at my own life, but you're awfully busy in that, that stage. I know. I mean, you've got kids, you've got, you know, you're really trying to ramp up your career. You would think that you'd see more volunteers maybe at, dare I say, our age where, you know, kids are getting older, you're, you, you might just have more time to do volunteering. So that's surprising to me. It surprised me too. I was really surprised. I thought it'd be older age or anyway. And the younger generation, they're like at 20, 18%. So they're much lower, but that makes sense to me because they're building a career. Yeah, yeah. But I always feel, too, that volunteering is the way you network. So mm. that's just my point of view. Yep. The other interesting thing I found out, mostly <laughs> white, white people, 26%, black, 19%, Asian, 18%, and Hispanic, 15%. Hmm. The state that volunteers the most is Utah, followed by ta-da, Minnesota, your state. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. Wow. Uh, and then last, but that was my little mom, <laughs> mom, mom for you. And, and last of all, Minneapolis is the highest, uh, Minneapolis area is in the highest area of 37% of people volunteer in Minneapolis. Wow. So that's one of the highest cities on the list. That's really impressive. I'm feeling very proud all of a sudden should, of living in, uh, you know, the greater yeah. Minneapolis area. <laughs> yeah. But I have to say they're, they're volunteering for food banks and that food banks has really gone up. I saw a ton of information about volunteers for food banks has really been really powerful and uh, mm -hmm. vaccine hunters. So those are the things that are current. Oh, you know. nice. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Right. But this leads to my thing is that I don't think there are enough women who can volunteer to help STEM. 
Ah, well, STEM is interesting because I think you're going to talk to someone about STEM. And I did a little bit of just, you know, catching up a bit on STEM. So again, just a, a reminder to everybody what STEM, STEM is the learning or or involvement in science, technology, engineering, and math. And I think we all have been talking about, you know, there's just a lot of disparity between women and men in those disciplines. I just did a bit of research before I got on the call about what are the statistics today. And I pulled these from the UN and, you know, the women who are involved in specifically in computer science and engineering is still only about 16 to 20 percent, which is really low in comparison to men. Mathematical and physical science is a little bit higher. It's more around 40 percent. But there's still a major gap out there. And one of the things that really stuck with me, especially in volunteering and especially kind of getting with the girls as they're going through school, is it said that when girls are in middle school, about, and this is per the National Girls Collaboration Project, when they're in middle school, about 74% or 75% of girls show an interest in STEM, which is great, thinking about biologies or, you know, all the different sciences that they can get involved in. But a very mere 0.04%, not even 1%, 0.04% of high school girls choose a computer <sighs> science degree in college. It's shocking, really shocking. Yeah, it's shocking. And almost every woman I've interviewed has said that the number of girls getting involved in STEM activities is dropping off. I personally think, and this is based on these stats, and this is what you just said, is there's the, the girls aren't seeing women as people of mentors, as people who are doing this, who actually have this experience and are teaching them. I mean, this is no slam on teachers because they do an amazing job, but most of them aren't technical in the way that they can teach that. And my whole interview with Madeline is talking about how do we get more women into teaching girls about technology? Because I think that's the that's the difference. That's They have to see women teaching it, not just men. Because then they go, oh, they're teaching that. They know this. And and she has some really great advice. And she and, and Madeline also has a great story, backstory, like how she got involved in it. And and that's and I, we did a deep dive. We I edited a bunch of it, but it's still really great. And she's she's an amazing person to talk to, and she's very enjoyable. And I geek out big time on what she taught the the high school girls. So oh, you should enjoy that. I'm excited to hear it. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I'm excited to hear it, and we'll talk to you again after the interview. Okay, great. Thanks, Lois. Today, I am interviewing Madeline Nelson. Madeline is a platform software engineer at Sprout Social in Chicago. I know you do national, though. And before that, she was at Brativity as a senior consultant uh, and did custom software developer. So I met Madeline, uh, what, about a year ago, Madeline? Uh, I think it might have been two years ago because COVID changes the timeline. But yeah. So uh, Madeline was volunteering to lead a, a workshop, an all-day workshop with uh, this program I work with, chicktech.org, which is where we teach high school girls. We introduce them to all kinds of technology. And I couldn't believe it. Madeline got the girls excited and taught the girls about APIs to a group of high school girls. Mm-hmm. That blew me away right off the bat, the fact that the girls were so excited about it. So I was like, I got to get to know Madeline a little bit. Yeah, that was a really fun, fun workshop. I thought it went really well. But yeah, I'm I'm also really glad the students loved it. I think a lot of it was just finding ways to tie the tech concepts back to their lives and their interests, maybe problems that like they see in their community. So I think bring, tying it all together is really the key there and channeling all of the energy. You know, if you have a, a fun time at a workshop, the students might say, oh, you know, computer science, I tried that once and it was fun. Right, right. What else? That leads us into our talk about what we really wanted to talk about, because I know you've been an active participant in teachers for Girls Who Code. And I know you and I share a passion in getting girls more, educating more girls in technology, STEM, 
And uh, that's how we got here, this discussion. So, Madeline, we started this conversation yesterday, and I said, hold on, let's have this conversation in, in a podcast, because I think other people want to hear it. You started to talk about your upbringing and how you got introduced to tech. Tell me how you got started in your upbringing. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's rewind a bit back to when I was in high school. So I grew up with a lot of privilege. Like I grew up in a really nice area, a really great school system. I had lots of professional, well-educated adults in my life. And at the time, I really loved two things. I loved math. I was really active on math team and I felt like I really excelled and just understood the topic well and creativity. So art and music and making new things or going on YouTube and teaching myself how to knit, things like that. So I was able to recognize these two areas and I went to those adults in my life and I was like, hey, I want to do both of these things. I don't really know what that looks like. You know, I don't know what jobs there are that pertain to both of those things. So I reached out to the adults in my life and I was like, what can I do? You know, teachers, what is out there? And I pretty universally got a response that was like, oh, architecture. Architecture is the perfect match between math and creativity. And I was like, okay, I don't know that much about architecture, but cool. Sounds good. You know, I'll give it a shot. Right. So I started applying to colleges and I applied for architecture and some math, like a little bit of variety in there. And we actually had a senior year of high school. We had a day when we got to shadow a professional in our community of whatever, you know, profession was available. And so I said, I, I'd love to shadow an architect and see what it's like and see if this is, you know, what I'm picturing right now. Right. And I did. And it was a really great day. I learned a lot. And at the end, I said, you know, this was cool. I can definitely see how some people would love this job, but this isn't what I was picturing. You know, this isn't really what I want. And so you know, <laughs> it was, but I really, I'm so glad that I had that experience, you know, because I was able to say, oh, okay, like, you know, that was cool, but not really for me. So I can check that one off. Oh, yeah. But that left me in a position where I was like, okay, now I know I don't want to do architecture, but I still want to do math and I'm still creative. I need to find a way to do that. And so when I started college, I was like, you know what, for now, I'm just going to do math. I'll find a way to incorporate creativity along the way. And while I was there my freshman year, I happened to be in an intro to engineering um, prerequisite class. I hadn't completely eliminated engineering from my, you know, possible majors. So I was like, might as well try it out. It was a fun rotational class. We could try out different kinds of engineering. Right. And one of the units as a part of that class was programming or computer science. And when I did that unit, I was shocked. It was nothing like I thought it would be at all. Right. I went into it thinking that computer science was memorizing ones and zeros, right? Right. I thought it involved always wearing a hoodie and <laughs> sitting in your parents' basement alone, you know, stealing money from credit cards. I thought it meant, you know, I had just spent 18 years of that point absorbing all of the stereotypes of tech and I hadn't had any kind of formal computer science education. So I had no reason to believe that that wasn't true. Right. You know, I was kind of like, oh, you know, that's I don't want to memorize ones and zeros. I'm talkative. That's not really what I want to do. Plus, you had a creative streak too. Yeah, no, and that's why. And, and they, they don't act like that's not in that. And it certainly is part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. That was the next revelation I had. So, in the engineering course, I was like, "Wow, this is awesome. This is really creative. I'm actually pretty good at it." And it, yeah, there are ones and zeros involved, but only at some level. And what I actually do day to day is create like solutions to really interesting problems that these really cool companies have. So yeah, it was, it was really eye opening. And I feel just so lucky that the stars happen to align in that way that I happened to stumble upon this career option while I was in college. And that kind of brings me back to what your original question was, where you were saying like that we both have the shared passion for, more girls and women into the tech industry. Totally, totally agree there. Right. I When I think about that story and like how I got into tech, I really think about like, I did have so much privilege that was really 
required to have those stars aligned for me to find computer science. If it was so hard for me to even know that tech was an option, right. given like all of my privilege and my background, then think of all the students out there that would love tech, that would do so well and solve so many cool problems that just don't even know what it is. They don't even know it's an option. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, I stumbled on, on technology when I was in my 30s. So it took me like, mm -hmm. I'm older than you. So same thing, you know, like it's something you fall into. And you're like, wow, why didn't somebody tell me about this? So that's why I think this is such a great conversation, you know, and you basically put in a nutshell what you like to do and how you have got into it. So talk to me a little bit about uh, Girls Who Code and how you got involved with that. Yeah, for sure. When I was a senior in college, I did a year long project about computer science education. So that also kind of, I realized that I had a passion for this and I was like, I need a project. I'm gonna <laughs> channel my energy into this for a year. Right. And it was essentially about how to find more teachers and train teachers that are specializing in other subjects to also teach computer science. Because at the end of the day, it is really hard to recruit technical teacher. So anyway, I, I already had my mind on that. And I think when I was doing research for it, I stumbled upon Girls Who Code. They um, were a pretty new nonprofit at the time. So there was a lot of publicity of like, oh, this uh, nonprofit popped up and Rajma Sajani, the CEO and founder has this really awesome viral TED talk going on. And I was like, huh, what's going on there? So that's how I um, heard about it. But I first got involved myself the summer after graduating college and before starting as a consultant. So I, yeah, I, I got some advice from a great mentor that said, the summer after you graduate is the only free time you're going to have left in your life. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what? That's kind of scary to think about. But it's true, you know? Well, it's sort of true. Exactly. And I was like, okay, well, I got to make the most out of the summer. What am I going to do? And I would love to be able to try out teaching and like this girls who code nonprofit seems pretty great. So I applied to be a teacher for the the seven week summer immersion program. And it was an adventure. I am based out of Chicago, like you mentioned, when I was talking to girls who code about it, I really needed it to fit in my schedule with starting my full time job. Right. They were like, hey, so we really need people in New York. Can you do that instead of Chicago? And I was like, oh, uh, sure. That sounds fun. So I, I lived with a friend for that summer and had a really great time. It was a really, really great experience. And then after that initial summer, I've tried to stay involved with Girls Who Code and other similar nonprofits like Chick Tech in different kinds of ways. Right. So it's hard to take seven weeks off of work to teach that program that I really love doing. So it, it's been a matter of finding other similar things that I can do like Chick Tech, like I'll do a workshop for a weekend right. or Girls Who Code has clubs that happen after school. And I, I've been helping out with one of those up in Rogers Park at Loyola. So it's just a matter of like finding ones that fit with your schedule. But yeah, that's great. Hey, so I, I, I want to ask your advice. Uh, I think these are all great ideas and I love the story. What I'm thinking about is because they're so hard to find good teachers who can teach tech, What? because I feel like the, our audience particularly, this is the digital dish, we're reaching out to women. When you get asked to do things like that, people go, oh no, I couldn't, uh, it takes a lot of time. You know, I feel like that's, like the, when they asked me to speak at one of the uh, women in IT breakfast, I said, oh no, nobody wants to hear from me. Well, they did and it was fun. So my question is, what would you say to someone who's thinking about it, but afraid to take the leap? Yeah, that is a great question. And I actually have been thinking about this myself too. When I when I have these opportunities and I'm like, oh, I, my friend would be really great for this. And you know, what is it that holds them back for not you know volunteering for it? What I've observed is that a lot of people feel like in order to teach for one of these workshops or clubs that you need to be an absolute expert in the topic that you're teaching. And I think if you were teaching a, a really advanced group, then sure, maybe that's true. But at the end of the day, these are students who are new to tech. And most of the explanations that I give to technical concepts are 
very, very introductory. Like I don't dive really deep into the technical details unless the students ask for it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think something that really holds people back is they, they feel unqualified. They feel like, oh, if a student asked me how the internet works, how would I answer that? But really, I think I would try to reassure them and say, you, you do know how the internet works. You have a great sense of that. You don't need to give the students every single detail about every, you know, level of the network and communication protocol that there is. You don't, that's not what they're asking. Right. It's really, it's really just a skill of saying, okay, like if, if I was in the student shoes and I'm asking what the internet is, what are they really asking? Are they asking if the internet is a metaphor? Are they asking <laughs> where the data centers are? Are they asking who oversees the process? Like you really just have to, it's a lot more of trying to understand what they're asking right. than about knowing all of those answers. And the thing is too, I, I do occasionally have students that ask me questions that I, I have no idea what the answer is to. And that's perfectly okay. It's totally okay. I'll say, that's an awesome question. And I, I don't really know the answer. Why don't we look that up? Right. Or if we don't have time for that in the moment, I can say, oh, okay, that was a really great question. I'm going to look into that so we can explore that tomorrow or whatever it is. Or like, I'll look into that later because I, I think that's a really interesting thought. And just to kind of affirm that, that creativity and curiosity that the student has. So yeah, hopefully that's good advice. I would love to have more people. Yeah. I, I think you're right because uh, they needed somebody for the Chick Tech kickoff last year. And they said, Jeannie, you could teach that's called soft circuits. And it was part of, creating software code and then you sew it. And so I'm really better at the sewing than I was at the creating this, the uh, code, but I had uh, one of my, the, one of the women on my group, Teresa, uh, she helped me cause she's a software developer. And I'm like, uh, Teresa, I need your help here. So I was helping with the sewing, but we, we got it to go and it was really fun. And you're right. They, they were looking for someone to guide them, not to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I, I love that advice. So I'm going to ask you one more question that I think is important. What made you think of APIs to teach the girls? How did you create that? Because it was the girls were really excited. I'm telling you, they all loved it. They learned something. And let me explain. I know I'm going to have to explain this to my co-hosts because APIs are the, uh, the interfaces between software so they can speak to each other. But that's a concept I would think, you know, would be hard to teach. What made you think of that? And, and what made you figure out a way to, a way to teach that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. At other programs that I taught in the past, so Girls Who Code, for example, we would do a lot of work with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to create a static website. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that's where coding courses start with students. And it's really great because you have a, an instant visual of what you've created, which is really like gratifying. During those programs, I often saw that the students would create their static website and then they would say, okay, but how do I make it work? How do I make this button search for things? How do I make this happen? Right. And how do I get a map in here? And right. those were all really great questions. And it leads you into the next step of like, okay, this is great. We've, we've gone over the concept of how to make the basic structure of a website, for example, but now they want it to actually be a web application. Like they want it to connect to the rest of the internet and um, provide a service for the user of some sort other than being purely informational. Right. So um, we were naturally led into that as a next topic when I was working with those students. And when we did have a lesson about APIs, the students were always so, you could see that they were just so excited because they could now understand how, or begin to understand how their website can fit into the rest of the internet. Oh. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'd had several of those experiences where I just saw the students get really excited about it because it is a really cool thing. Yeah, it is. No, 100%, but not everybody understands that. And it's a, I think it's a hard concept. Mm -hmm. But, okay, I'm going to describe what you had. Okay. So what you did was you had them cut up pieces of paper, and this is just me seeing it in, in the workshop, and they cut up pieces of paper with words on it or connector words, I believe they were. And so the teams had to work together, and you created a tube, a, a standing tube, for them to put 
the letters through so that somebody could pick it up on the other side and put it through their tube, showing a visual of how the application would. I just thought, how'd you think of that, Madeline? That was so great. And the girls were having so much fun and they were figuring it out and saying, oh, okay, this needs to connect to this application or this tube. And, and it was really a great visualization. Yeah, no, it was fun. I, I'm i really glad that you like have such a great memory of it. I think that shows that it worked well. Um, so I don't know if I have an answer to how I thought of it. I just, oh, okay. Well, that's cool. I, but I think that's something that's important when you're thinking about how to teach it, how to make it so it's something real that you can say, oh, this is something, I know we can't do it during COVID, uh, so now we're extra challenged. Mm -hmm. But seriously, how do, you con how do you do a visual that you actually remember? And I literally what popped in for five minutes because I was running man on the front desk during the workshop. I was like, this is great. You know, mm -hmm. well, yeah, take my mother, my 89 year old mother here. She's going to learn how to APIs. Work. Yeah, no, it was really fun. I can also, um, I think you did a really great job of summarizing it. I can give a little more detail about what the, what, how that metaphor played out. Right. And like, yeah, how that worked. Yeah. um, so what we did was I created a like fictional API. I think it was about dogs to be. If I remember correctly, like a dog of the day API. Yeah. And with this fictional API, I created um, a small sheet with documentation about the different endpoints that were available with that API. Mm -hmm. And then with the, each of those endpoints, we were also breaking down um, each of the URL components into, you know, like here's the protocol, here's the port. That might be implied, maybe the port's not listed, and here's the edge that we're doing, here's the HTTP method. And we were able to, yeah, we cut up pieces of paper. Each piece of paper represented one of those different components of the URL. Right. So on the table, you might have a ton of different pieces of paper, and you have some that are HTTP, and then you have some that are HTTPS. And we could, that brings up a conversation like, oh, what, when might you use one versus the other? What's the difference? So um, we had that. And then what we did um, talking about the, the tube thing, you're totally right. This is coming back to me now. I loved it. Yeah. So we, um, we had one of those cardboard trifolds that you use for like science projects. Right. That represented our server. Right. Yeah, so we set that up, we wrote an IP address, I think we just made one up, and we wrote it in Sharpie on the front. And then we cut out two holes in the side that were representing different ports on that server. And we wrote down the port number on that like tube. And the students would work together with their teams, look at the documentation sheet to figure out what API endpoint they wanted. They would um, construct a URL with the different components that they need. I think they tape them together or something. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. And then they would have one student act as, you know, the wire and they would <laughs> go on, walk on over, walk their endpoint over their request and put it through the port tube that the server had. And then the server, I think this was one of our point of points of weakness and areas for improvement. But <laughs> behind our server, we had um, some volunteers helping write the JSON data response. Um, and so they were frantically writing what the response would be. We forgot <laughs> to print those out. And they, they would take in the request and then they would return back a status code and here's the data. And then the students would be like, oh, okay, we have this data, you know, we have the ID of the dog of the day, but now we need to use that ID to get the dog's name. What endpoint can we use to get the name? And so we kind of made it into a fun problem solving activity. It's, it's like a treasure hunt. Almost. Yeah, kind of like a treasure hunt. Another takeaway was that it ended up being a lot shorter of an activity than I had planned. Like I thought it would take the students a lot longer to connect these different concepts to be able to right. do this, but no, they right away, figured out exactly what to do. And at the end, they had really, really great questions. Like I remember one student um, asked a question about how many ports a computer actually has or like a server would have. And I was like, you know what? I don't know. I think the number starts with a six, <laughs> but that is all I got for you, you know? And that was a great example. Like, yeah, we love this workshop and I think the students got a lot out of it, but as an instructor, I don't know all the answers. And I think be, it, it gives an opportunity for the instructors to be a role model and saying that it's okay to not know all the answers, right? Like yeah. it doesn't make me less of an instructor. It, yeah. 
it's okay. And we can continue that curiosity and not be ashamed for not knowing every single thing. So that's awesome. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. That's, that was fun. That was really, I, I so enjoyed that. And, I, and what's enjoyable is watching the girls enjoy it and learning at the same time. So that's for me, was really exciting. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Yes, thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank you. That was a great discussion. Now that my co-hosts, Lois and Julie, have listened to the interview, here's their reaction. Hey, Julie, it's good to see you again. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Another great interview. I can't wait to talk to you about it. Yes, it was really good. I tell you what, as I was listening, I was thinking back, you know, going down memory lane about, you know, she was saying how she really benefited from people around her who could help her as she was trying to think what she wanted to do in her career. And I just remember I grew up in a very small town, well, actually on a farm outside of a very small town in, uh, in, you know, the middle of the country in the Midwest. And, you know, you didn't really have a lot of role models or, you know, of course, back then we didn't have internet. We didn't have ways to really see what our options. And I remember a good friend of mine in high school, she said, you know, Lois, I think you, you should go into engineering. And I remember sitting there going, why would she think I'd want to drive trains? Because I had no idea what engineering was. I had no way to even consider that there's lots of things you could do in engineering. Oh, that's so funny. So anyway, I got an accounting degree because I knew what accountants did. And, you know, I just went into something I knew. But, you know, I just think why, you know, it, it was so hard for me as someone who didn't have exposure or role models or people around me to figure out what are all those options. And, you know, that's something that we really should consider for the young women of today is how do we give them more exposure to what are options out there? I agree. I heard that first part and I thought, you know, math and creativity, like that's, that's the essence of a bipolar person. (laughs) I was like, and I don't even know how somebody leads to architecture out of that, but it was great. I thought, well, that's, that's, interesting um and I had a similar experience I was I I loved French I French was my major I was determined to make that my major but I didn't want to teach it and I didn't want to do a lot of things I had no idea what I was going to do with this right or maybe business it'll fit into but that navigational part of our careers (laughs) is so important and and it's so easy to be lost not only at the beginning but in the middle and and Mm -hmm. you know I think folks that are rethinking their careers have the same issue like okay I've been doing this but like, uh, how do I navigate from here and yeah. you know, think about it differently? Well, I don't know if, you know, I, I, you wonder if it would be great looking back. I think now, you know, when you get to a certain age, you think, oh, look at all these critical decisions I made at certain points. And boy, was that important. And, you know, you kind of see how it goes. But when you're in the moment, right, when you're just starting out or you're in midway through, how do you know where this is going to go? I think, you know, um, it being experimental or, you know, not being way too, I guess, overwhelmed by the fact that you could be making some different changes, just try it out. Not be afraid to try things out because it doesn't mean your whole life is going to change just because of that one thing. It's just giving yourself more options to consider. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pressure early on, you know, to pick the right thing or start in the right place that makes it feel a lot more permanent than it is. And, you know, after we all stumble, you know, from one place to another in our careers for a while, we realize it's really more about navigating our careers and and that there isn't this permanency. And we can, you know, start somewhere and use that to kind of steer ourselves professionally, you know, into places that have more or sometimes we, you know, make a mistake. Up and I have less entrance, and you know, you got to get out of there and move on to something else. But, but you probably, I think folks have a lot more um, power. They're a lot more empowered to do that than you feel, you know, initially, or when you have some big setback, or, you know, when some, some big life change is facing you. And to me, it was important and empowering it made me think about I am empowered and I have steered my career like I didn't know I was but I have been (laughs) yeah well you know I think we probably all had some missteps or we tried different things but I've always kind of lived by a kind of a notion of you always have one foot in something that you know and always put one foot in something that you don't know. So personally, even though I've been in IT for pretty much my whole career because I joined a, a 
IT provider as a company out of college. I didn't know anything about IT. I was a finance person because I went into accounting, right? So I really understood numbers, but then I got introduced into, you know, some of the concepts and things that you do from software development and so forth. And each step I made, I, you know, had that one foot in something that I felt very secure and knowledgeable and an expert in, but one foot that I could always learn. And you just kind of keep navigating yourself to the point where now you're in something that you didn't have any experience in, you know, maybe three or four steps ago, but now you're in something completely different, different, but you navigated there, right? You learned something new in each step and then you could expand from there and decided where, where you wanted to go from there. Yeah, I love that theory. And, you know, it also, I like that the interview and the conversation that Jeannie had um, with Melanie was, um, went from thinking about yourself and your own career and, you know, how you stumble through or navigate through. And then it, it merged into how you project that outwardly and share that with other people. So, you know, they got to a point where they were talking about what holds you back from teaching, you know, and is it you feel unqualified or you need to know everything or a couple of things that stuck in my mind. And I just thought, you know, it. how can I accelerate the, the notion that I probably know more than I think I know in some areas. And, you know, to someone, I'm qualified to teach them something. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't have to know everything to do that. And how does that lead us, you know, if we, if we think about that we, there are some valuable things that you can teach to someone else, how can you then use that to, to position yourself as a thought leader, you know, amongst peers or then more broadly in the organization? And, um, and that's not an easy step. It just feels like it takes a while to get your sea legs on that and, and feel like not only can you manage your own ship, but you can help others in the steering of theirs. Yeah. And I think to that point of you don't need to be an expert, I, I love that part that she talked about because you're right, no matter who you work with, even in your own companies or in your families or your communities, Sometimes just having a conversation about experiences, people learn from that. You know, you may not, you know, be able to educate on, you know, the theory of something, but you can certainly talk about your experience in working with something or how that was used in a real business sense or a real world, you know, environment. And people learn from that, those real tangible aspects. So I know we need to encourage ourselves, encourage those around us to really take that knowledge and, and share it with others. Share it with share it with the blooming kids out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And and blooming kids or those of us that are learning from others, you know, maybe my last life lesson comes from I hear my husband say over and over again, confirm by three, confirm by three, <laughs> confirm by three, right? So so just because you're listening to somebody tell you how the world is, you know, you also need to figure out how to evaluate the sources that, you know, that are sharing you know their insights with you and inputs and so you know the the more the point of that being you know the more different places that you feel like you're intaking and learning from like the better perspective the more rounded perspective that gives us no matter where we are in our career and navigating it so Absolutely. Well, I just have, before we close this, I have to share one more thing. <laughs> so my daughter, she's now 17 and she's, you know, picking colleges and thinking what she wants to do. And she just told me a few weeks ago, she decided to pick her major. And you know what she decided to pick? Oh, no. What? Engineering. <laughs> thought, oh, my God. There we go. At least someone's going to go do it. <laughs> I don't think she'll be driving trains. Yeah, I don't think she'll be doing that either. <laughs> you didn't tell her. You didn't tell her your big early life story, did you? So she could laugh at you. I did. You no, I hadn't. I, maybe I did tell her. I didn't tell her ahead of time. I just thought, oh my god, there it is. It's like a full circle. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, All right. Well. Good to chat with you, Julie. Likewise, and for everybody out there who's heard and been inspired by this interview, like, have fun with it. It's your career, you know. The job's going to be a little bit, you know, um, a job's a job, but <laughs> but it's not right. permanent, and you can certainly navigate your way through. It's an adventure. Thanks for joining us on ISG Digital Dish. If you like our podcast, subscribe and please rate and review us. Thanks. <laughs>